Mother's Day has always been a very special day for us here at the Highlands for the past 33 years. We have celebrated our moms because they are such an important part of our life, aren't they? An important part of the church. Now, I want you to think with me for a moment. Maybe you've never done this because we're so focused when it comes to the crucifixion of Jesus, our Savior. We think about him and his experience on the cross, but have you ever just taken a moment online? Have you taken a moment to just think about what Mary might have been thinking, the mother of Jesus? The questions that she might have been asking as she's now looking up at the son, her firstborn, who is on display for all to see, who suffered and bled and died for the sins of the world. But can you just imagine what she was thinking and feeling in that moment? Well, this is a great time for us to stop and honor our moms because as we're kind of beginning to see hope uh, from the pandemic and all the impact and effect, there's probably no greater group of people than moms who have experienced uh, the effect of this and then have picked up also the responsibility to care for others and meet the needs of their family. I know that for me, this will be the first year that I've celebrated a Mother's Day without my mom, who was 90 years old when she passed in the arms of Jesus on December the 22nd and actually died from COVID, uh, the COVID disease. But uh, really think about her today and what a, you know, I heard a guy, yes, I did, you know, seven weeks I've been going through cancer radiation treatment. I wasn't sure I was going to be able to do this service, but Mother's Day has always been so important to me as a pastor and I really wanted to, to preach this service, but then I got asked to do a wedding and a, and a funeral, and I heard somebody at the funeral talk about uh, the, the woman who had passed away, and she said, he, they said, she has been the glue of our family. And I thought, boy, that is just a great, great way to uh, think of our moms. They, they really are the glue, and so we recognize them. How many of you have ever cringed when your child maybe said something inappropriate in public. You know, you're in line at Lowe's and your child turned, because they haven't developed filters yet, right? They're just really, really honest beings and uh, turn around and see a rather large man behind you and say, do you have a baby in your tummy too? <laughs> or, you know, uh, mommy, why are your arms so flabby? Or to have them say to you as a dad, why does your breath stink? And now the whole restaurant knows, right? And, or you got a boogie in your nose. But can you imagine being the mother of Jesus, the son of God? I mean, he said some pretty wild stuff. And if you read the Bible, you know that. Online, if you read the Bible, you know that Jesus said some things that were very provocative and very seemingly strange at the time. And I want to talk about that. I want to focus on that a little bit today about some of the encounters that Jesus had with his mo mother. And I want to particularly talk about three things that Jesus said to his mother. And uh, you're going to say, did he really say that? Are you kidding me? And uh, yes, he did. And if you've ever been a mother you might kind of really realize and connect with this a little bit. But I want to really challenge you today, moms, I, but not just moms, because I don't, think, uh, I don't think this message is just for moms. We're going to sort of target our moms, but I think there are things to learn here for all of us, whether you're a mom or dad or a son or a daughter or whoever you are, uh, there's something for you to learn here. I want you to look with me uh, at the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, beginning with verse 46, if you would. And if you don't have your Bible, if you have your Bible, open your Bible. Bring your Bible. I mean, just be in the practice of having God's Word with you and bring your Bible. But, of course, we always put it on the screen as well. But in Matthew chapter 4, uh, chapter 12, rather, verse 46, it says, As Jesus was speaking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. 
Someone told Jesus, your mother and your brothers are standing outside, and they want to speak to you. Now, what would you expect Jesus to say? I mean, your mom and your brothers have come a pretty good distance to visit you. And what would you expect him to say? But notice what Jesus, Jesus asked, who is my mother? And who are my brothers? Then he pointed to his disciples and said, look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. Now put yourself there. Online, put yourself there because your son has rock star status. Huge crowds, and you travel quite a ways to see him. He's very popular. So what do you do? You go to the green room and you knock on the door and the posse comes to the door and you say, I'd like to see my son. And you, they said, okay, wait right here, we'll, we'll check. And you hear him over say, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? But those who do God's will, they are my family. And how do you feel about that? If you're Jesus' mom, because it's, it's, it's a tremendous challenge to be a mom, but to be the mother of God is, is even more so. Would you agree with that? But she doesn't get offended. She doesn't walk away with hurt feelings. Now, we know from other passages that there was a little tension in in the home. I mean, Jesus' brothers were not buying what he was selling. And they would not until after his crucifixion and resurrection. On one occasion, they're coming to claim Jesus because They think he's gone crazy. They think he's out of his mind and they need to take control of his life. But I don't think Mary was in that camp. I know it was really hard because being a mom is really hard. But it's hard to separate a child from the heart of his mother. And she will defend her child even though he has a different view. And if we were to talk to to Mary and say, what about this, Mary? I mean, can you believe what he said? And she's she's, going to say, you don't really know him like I do. You, You haven't watched him. I mean, at first I took things a little personally. But then I began to realize that he's always teaching. He walks into the garden with his guys and He'll pick something up and say, the kingdom of heaven is like this. So everything was a teaching moment. I I don't take it personal anymore. And if you want to hear a really tough one, she would say, let me tell you about the time when he said, you got to hate your mama. You got to hate your brothers and your, your, your sisters. Now, his brothers got all worked up about it, but I knew what he meant. I know that he's really just saying that when it comes to your love for God, in comparison, every other relationship would be as though you hated that person. You hated your mother. You hated your father. You hated your siblings. But really, he's just making a comparison. He's teaching about what God's kingdom is like. I, I never felt hated. In fact, I never felt more loved than I did from him. Well, what I want to do today is I want to delve into some of the conversations that Mary had with Jesus. And I, I wish we had more, but you know, we're going to talk about when Jesus was preteen and, and uh then after that, some encounters and what he said to her and what her responses were. And we're going to look at the context of those situations and we're going to learn, we're going to, we're going to see what God is speaking in the midst of that, what God wants to speak to us uh, today. And this is for everybody, moms and dads and daughters and sons and singles and married. What is God saying to you today well first of all i think god is saying to moms with 
difficult children. Anybody ever had them or you have them now? He's saying, don't give up. Online, out in the tent, he's saying, don't quit, don't give up. How do you know that mom's jobs are so tough? Well, have you seen this video? Check this out. Just give me one second. Thank sure. you. Sorry. Uh huh. Hey. Hi. Two minutes. Thank you. Hi. Good afternoon. Sorry about hey, that. Oi. Hi, nice Hi. to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Have you ever done one of these interviews over, over the camera before? No. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the job to get started with. It's not just um, a job. It's sort of probably the most important job. Uh, the title that we have going right now is Director of Operations, but it's really kind of so much more than that. Responsibilities and requirements are, are really quite extensive. Uh, first category for the requirements would be mobility. This job requires that you must be able to work standing up most or really all of the time, uh, constantly on your feet, constantly bending over, constantly exerting yourself, a high level of stamina. Uh, uh, okay. That's a lot. For how many, like, for how many hours? Uh, 135 hours to unlimited hours a week. It's basically 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'm sure you'll have a chance from time to time to maybe just sit down here and there, yeah? Uh, you mean like a break? Yeah. Uh, no, there are no breaks available. Is, th is that even legal? Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. Okay, yeah. so like no lunch? You can or... have lunch, but only when the associate is done eating their lunch. Uh, I think that's a little intense. No, no not possible. That's crazy. Now, this position requires excellent negotiation and interpersonal skills. We're really looking for someone that might have a degree in uh, medicine, in finance, and the culinary arts. You must be able to wear several hats. Associate needs constant attention. Sometimes they have to stay up with an associate throughout the night. Being able to work in a chaotic environment, if you, if you had a life, we'd ask you to sort of give that life up. No vacations. In fact, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, and holidays, the workload is going to go up, and we demand that with, with a happy disposition. Uh, that's almost cruel. <laughs> that's almost uh, a very, very sick, twisted joke. Sorry, but when there's time to sleep or... Oh, no time to sleep. Yeah, all-encompassing, all almost. That's exactly right. 365 days a year? Yes. No, that's, that's inhumane. That's, that's very insane. The meaningful connections that you make and the, the feeling that you get from really helping your associate are immeasurable. Also, let's cover the salary. The position is going to pay absolutely nothing. Excuse me? No. Nobody's doing it for free. Yeah, pro bono. <laughs> Completely for free. <laughs> no! What if I told you there's someone that actually currently uh, holds this position right now? Billions of people, actually. Who? Moms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Moms. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> oh! <laughs> and they meet every requirement, oh, don't wow. they? Oh my god. Moms are the best! Yeah, there's no pay. They're 24 hours. They're always there. Now I'm thinking about my mom. Yeah, and what are you thinking about her? I'm thinking about all those nights and everything. Thank you so much for everything you do. I know it doesn't seem like I appreciate all of it, but I definitely do. <laughs> So, Mom, I want to say thank you for everything that you've done. I love you very much. You've been there through thick and thin. My mom is just awesome. She's awesome. Isn't that just awesome? I mean, Mom's jobs has got to be the most difficult job in the whole wide world, especially when you are the mother of God. Would you agree with that? And I want, I want you to imagine uh, the scene where they have traveled 80 miles on foot in a caravan, because during that time, uh, you had to travel in groups because of the fear of being set upon by robbers and thieves. And, and so they would travel because it was just lots of open area uh, to be attacked, and so they would travel in a caravan with friends and neighbors and family. And this would have been a three-day trip from where they lived, from Nazareth to Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem wasn't a huge, huge city, and it was sitting on a hill, 
But whenever they had the Passover meal celebration in Jerusalem, it would grow by like three times or more. And so very, very quickly, uh, the, the city would just be crowded. And, uh, you know, it's exciting to go on a trip. Anybody love going on a trip? I love preparing for a trip and look forward to it. And you're excited about getting there. But after a while, it just kind of, you know, gets tiring and and, and the, uh, the, the excitement fades really, really fast. And then when you've been there and you're coming home, now you're dirty and you're really tired and you just want to get home and, and, and sleep and, and take a shower. But here they've, they've come, they've experienced all the da- dancing, all the celebrating and declaring God's goodness, and they're on their way home. And the first night in camp, they are preparing the meal, and Mary says... Where is Jesus? Have you seen Jesus? And, and Joseph says, no, he's probably hanging out with his cousins. And so they go and look for him, but he's not in the camp. And so they realize he has not come with them on this journey home. And so they know they've got to go back, but they can't go back now because it's nighttime and you can't travel at night. There's no lights. There's no real roads, paved roads like we have today. And so they know they have to sleep through the night, but they're but they actually not going to sleep, Right. Their son, their 12-year-old son is missing, and and they're not going to be able to sleep. So they get up early the next morning, and they hustle off to Jerusalem, and they're looking through the city. This this beautiful city of God, they're looking through it, all of its winding, very confusing streets. We've been there many times. In fact, by the way, uh, we want to tell you that we're going back. Pastor Jeremy and Pastor Amy, we're going back uh, this year in March, actually this coming year year in March. So if you want to go with us, we've been about seven, eight times, and we'd love to have you. This is going to be an absolutely fantastic trip. So if you're interested at all, let us know. We'll put you on a list, and as soon as we get the information, we'll, you'll be the first uh, to get it. But they go back, and, and they're in the city, and they can't find. Three days, they're looking for Jesus. Now, picture your preteen, right? You, you can't find him. For, have you ever lost your kid and couldn't find him? I remember when Terry and I were in Disneyland, and I went into the restroom, and came out, and I said, where's Jeremiah? That's our firstborn son. He's just a little guy, but he's very adventurous, and he had no fear. He would just wander off, and she said, oh my goodness, where is he? He was here just a second ago, and we looked for 15 minutes, and we were absolutely scared to death, and we were ready to go to security, when all of a sudden, here he comes, just walking along like nothing happened, you know, and, uh, but we've all kind of had that moment. We held our breath. I mean, he's been kidnapped. He's, is he'd been sold into slavery. But finally, notice with me, in Luke chapter 2, verse 46, it says, three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. His parents didn't know what to think. Son, son. <laughs> I mean, how would you say it, Mom? Come on. You haven't found your preteen son for three days. You've been looking, well, how are you going to, you're not going to go, oh, son. You know, it's like, son. <laughs> His mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic, searching for you everywhere. So some of the smartest people in the whole world have been utterly amazed with their son, and, and she's not impressed with any of that. She is happy she found him, be sure about that, but she's also furious with him that he's done this to them. And, and, and then if that wasn't enough, check out his response. <laughs> Come on, Mom, put yourself in this place, okay? Now look, notice what he says, but why did you need to search? <laughs> he asked. Just, so, I mean, at that point, she's like over the top. Only moms would understand this. She's over the top. Now what she wants to hear, she, or that's not what she wants to hear. She, she wants to hear, Mom, I'm so sorry. I lost track of the time. Please forgive me. I'll never do it again. But notice, he says, didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he meant. Have you ever been there when your teen or preteen gave you an answer to a complicated question and you didn't understand. Have you ever had a team that you didn't understand what they were talking about? Come on, let's see your hand. Yeah, all the time. They didn't have a clue. Doesn't make sense. So, you know, moms, this might be a difficult season for you right now. 
You're wondering how you're going to keep up with this. How are you going to keep up? You, 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 you are not convinced that you are living up to expectation of raising your kids, especially in the midst of the, the, the challenges of, of coronavirus. You watch this video that we just saw together, and you're saying, that's me. That's exactly it. I'm working full-time, maybe outside the home. I've got a preteen that's struggling with transition and making poor choices. And here's what God says to you this morning. Here's what God says to you online and out in the tent. God says to you, don't give up. Don't quit. Terry and I had seven children. There were five girls and two boys. I kind of wish that ratio had been a little differently because girls can be a challenge, I want to tell you, for a father, and especially when it comes to wedding times and you got to pay the bill, you know. Um, we have 16 grandchildren, nine boys and seven girls. I want to tell you, I didn't, people who've been around a long time, they know this to be true. I didn't do a lot of parenting series in the early going because I kind of wanted to see how it turned out. You know, you, I don't want to declare yourself an expert, you know, before, you know, the proof is in the pudding, right? And many of you are watching the pudding right now. Maybe I'll get off into doing some parenting teaching now because all of my kids love Jesus. They're all serving the Lord, and I think that's always a victory, isn't it? I mean, it hasn't always been great. It hasn't always been perfect, but they all love Jesus. But here, here's what I think the Lord would say to you. If you're going through a tough time, whether it is related to, to, to raising children or not, God would say, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. You know, often, isn't it true, we get focused on two or three little uh, kind of insignificant matters or, or situations, and, and, and we become overwhelmed with that because we're, we're focused in on that, and we just need to understand this stuff is going to pass. It, eventually, it's going to, it, we're going to get beyond it. And Mary responds. She finds him. She chews him out, and he gives her this explanation that makes no sense. But it got better. Watch this. Watch this. Online, watch this. Luke chapter 2, verse 51. Then he returned to Nazareth with them and, and moms, you might want to underline this, was obedient to them. That's so cool. Isn't that great when your kids finally get it? And, and he's obedient. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all people. Now, he goes from being this preteen, you know, mom, what are you searching for me for? I've got to be about my father's business and, you know, kind of giving her this answer that doesn't make sense to her to, to growing and developing. He grew in wisdom. He grew in stature with God and with, with his relationship with, with other people. I, I think what God wants to say to, to moms. I think what God wants to say to you and me uh, online, what God wants to say to you uh, today, that don't give up. There's going to be better times ahead. Even in difficult circumstances, there is something, there's the next thing that God has for you, and it's just ahead. Now, the next thing I think that I want us to focus on uh, in the encounter between Jesus and his mother is that moms experiencing a victory need to cherish that moment. You might not say, you might say, you know what, right now things are just really good for me and, and my kids are doing well, we, we, our relationship is good, everything's going smoothly, and if anything, during the COVID, we've gotten closer together, and, but you just need to cherish that moment. As a parent, even with difficult children, there are a lot of wins. But many times we get, we get preoccupied with the, the minuscule nuances of what's going on, and we miss the greater thing. We miss out entirely on the greater thing that God is doing among us. Would you agree with that? We do that all the time. I, I was uh, talking to one of my grandsons, and I said, how's it going, bud? And he said, uh, not so good. I said, really? I said, what, what have you been doing today? We went to the zoo. I said, 
what is not good about the zoo? Elephants and, you know, gorillas and you know, all kinds of, that, that sounds like a fun, well, I had a, I had a runny nose. I had a, my throat was sore, you know, he came up with about three or four things, you know, that were kind of not good things, but it's like he missed the whole, the whole point, I mean, he missed the whole, focusing on three things that weren't good, he missed the celebration of what was good. Isn't it wonderful when a child finally learns to smile? How many of you love the day when your kid learned to feed themselves? Wasn't that a great accomplishment? Uh, they learned to use the toilet, they finally figured out this math thing. The ability to demonstrate compassion. Maybe they came to you and asked you to tell them a Bible story or to pray. As a teenager, you listen to them and realize they're finally getting it. And you celebrate and you cherish that moment. And you learn to find those moments in every single place. Day. One of my favorites is when Mary invites Jesus to go with her to a, apparently a relative's wedding. Now, remember the last one, he was about 12 years old. Now he's in his 30s. And he's just, he's just put his posse together. He just rounded up his disciples. And I mean, weddings were huge in those days. I mean, they're fun. We had a wedding this weekend, a lot of fun at the wedding, but back in those days, there was nothing going on. Life was pretty boring <laughs> in many ways compared to today. So weddings were like huge and fun times of celebration. And so they went, and uh, I mean, they're especially fun when you're not paying for them, right? When you have to pay for them, it's a little bit different story. You got the bride and, and, and the uh, mother of the bride, and they're just, you know, they're just wound tight and the groom is kind of loosey-goosey, and that's making everybody else kind of tense, you know. And uh, Mary tells them that they run, uh, tells Jesus they run out of wine, and he says, woman, now we could read that and say, well, that's kind of disrespectful, but we know the Bible says that Jesus never sinned, right? So he's not saying this in a disrespectful way. In fact, if you understood this in the cultural context, text, you, you realize that this was a very kind of endearing, loving expression and he says in John 2, 4, he says, Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus said, My hour has not yet come. And Mary, you know, moms always know best, right? Come on. And Mary's like, you know, why not now? I mean, she knows who he is now. By now, she knows who this is. And she says, why not now? This is a great stage. Show your stuff. Show what you got. They're out of wine. And Jesus is like saying, this isn't my deal, Mom. It's not my time. But mamas always know the right time. And here we have the Son of God and uh, his mother Mary, and he's saying, this is not, not the time. You know, if I said that to, to my mother, you know, uh, I'm glad Jesus didn't sin. Uh, but good Jewish mothers, uh, you know, she, like a good Jewish mother, she didn't listen to him. She just presses on, you know. How many moms, come on, you, you gotta, how many of you ever had a mom that just, you know, she's gonna get you there. I mean, even if you're gonna resist, she's gonna press through. And that's, that's this mom, John 2, 5 says, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. I mean, she's just disregarding what he just said. Just do whatever he tells you. She knows he's gonna come through. And, uh, and, and so he does. And now he's in his 30s. He's not a kid anymore. And um, some, someone said, someone said, there always comes a time in a young man's life when he needs to stand up to his mother and say, I'm not a child anymore. And for most of us, that comes around age 45, right? <laughs> she believes in him. You know, no one believes in their kids like a mother. Would you agree with that? especially a Jewish mother. You know the definition of a genius, right? It, 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 it's an average student with a Jewish mother. We, meet, we need more Jewish mothers in the world, and Mary was a classic Jewish mother. And Jesus listens to his mom. He's forced a little, but he performs his very first miracle. 
and it's a great victory. And there's something, it's interesting here, that I never saw before. I want you to look with me at verse 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples, and there they stayed for a few days. Mothers, listen to me. In those moments where things go right, at those times when you finally see things are coming together, he starts to pick up his clothes. She really listens, and they make you proud. Stay there for a few days. Camp on that. Don't be so quick to move on. Stop and remember that difficult season that had passed and cherish the good times. Online, cherish those good times that you have. Recognize them. And then number three, to moms experiencing a heartbreak, one day God will mend your broken heart. One more picture of Mary. We come back where Mary's standing at the foot of the cross, and she's heartbroken. This is the same baby, her firstborn, that she had rocked in the cradle. That she had looked for, remember, when he was 12 years old throughout Jerusalem, and now they're back in Jerusalem, and he's on display. Hanging from a cross, rejected and crucified. No mother should ever have to bury her child. She is brokenhearted beyond words. Maybe as a mom, you can relate. Truth known. Nobody knows around you, but if the truth were known, you're heartbroken. Maybe it's infertility, miscarriage, infidelity, hurtful words, painful memories. I know of mothers that stay away from Mother's Day service for this very reason. I can't pretend to understand your pain. But listen now to Jesus' words in John 19, verse 25. Standing near the cross were Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene, when Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciples that he loved, he said to her, I want you, this is a little side note here, where you find this expression, the disciple that Jesus loved, you know who, who it is? It's John. You know what book of the Bible it appears in? The book of John. So this is John writing about himself, right? The, the disciple that Jesus loved. How many of you had kids like that? It's like, no, mom loves me more than you, right? And um, he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. And he said to his disciple, Here is your mother. And from then on, the disciples took her into his home. Even in his pain, even in his worst moment of suffering, he's thinking about taking care of his mother and her future. And he turns to his friend, John, and he says, John, she's now your responsibility. You take care of my mom. You take care. See, Jesus is in pain, but he knows that it's going to end. And he knows that he is preparing a place for us, a place where there will be no more pain, a place for his followers. But regardless of the circumstances in that moment, he knows that he's got to prepare for mom. Now, Terry and I have been in Ephesus, and we stood in, in the, the little theater there where Paul preached in Ephesus. And what we know about the church in Ephesus is that John went to be the pastor of that church, and so they can take you to a house that they claim was the house where Mary and John lived. That's pretty awesome. They're pretty sure this is it. This is the house. Why was she in Ephesus? Because John was taking care of her. What provision does God make for your pain? Let me show you. 
Psalm 9, uh, 34, verse 18. It says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. You say, where's God in my pain? Well, let me tell you, he's close to you. Maybe you can't see him. Have you ever been so close to something you couldn't see it? Online, have you been close to something and it was right there, but you didn't see it? He's always right there in your pain. Psalm 147, verse 3 says, He heals the brokenhearted and he bandages, bandages their wounds. I remember my kids when they were growing up. We were pastoring in Canyon Country, California, and um, there are a few people in the church here still that uh, the keys, for example, in the last service that, that um, knew us then. I mean, we, we had this really, really steep hill, hill the road right in front of our house. It was very, very steep. And so we, we spent more than a few times taking our kids to urgent care or to the emergency room. And, and you know, fortunately, no broken bones. But uh, Amy, I'm thinking about uh, one time in particular, I think we rushed you off to the emergency room because your brother had built this super cart and he let you be the test dummy, right? <laughs> and uh, even gave you a good push going down and the thing fell apart on him. But there were lots of wounds. And, I, you know, I can tell you with a clear conscience that when my kids were hurting, when they needed care, they did not come into the house saying, Daddy, Dad, where are you? You know what they said? Mommy, Mommy, where are you, Mommy? Because they knew that their mother would take care of it. Oh, she'd get out the peroxide at first. Because she knew that the wound had to be clean. But after that, she'd put on the, the soothing, whatever they put on. And Mama would always kiss it and bandage it. You know, they say that scars are kind of like tattoos, only they have better stories. You know what your scars really mean? It means you survived. <laughs> you survived. When your heart is broken, when you're wounded, it says God bandages the wounds. And sometimes he puts a little peroxide on them, cleaning out the impurities. He bandages you up and he heals you and sometimes even leaves a little scar so that you have a story that you can tell. Psalm 68, verse 6 says, God places the lonely in families. He sets the prisoners free and gives them joy. Jesus knew that his mother would be lonely. Doesn't mean that she wouldn't have people around her, but he knew she was going to be lonely, and so he placed her in a spiritual family. And I want to say to some of you here today, you're lonely. You, you're surrounded by a big crowd. Maybe online, you, you've got people around you, and, or maybe out in the tent, it's probably full right now, and you've got people sitting around you, but that doesn't mean you're not lonely. Well, guess what? You came to the right place. God knew you would be here today, and he's made available a spiritual family. And can I tell you, this is a family that is full of broken people. If you thought you were coming to a perfect church, well, swing and a miss. If it was perfect, it wouldn't be perfect after you showed up, right? Kind of, that's the way it works. But really, this church is full of people that have experienced brokenness in life. That's one of the reasons we have on the wall up here somewhere, it says men. One of the things God told us is that he wanted to mend people here. A place where he, we could experience God's grace and his healing. You know how he does that? Through connecting you with the family. We're going to be talking uh, in the near future a lot more about the importance of being in a life group or some kind of a group. You know, those, those are groups where you, you, you can get where you can't get from a large gathering of believers. It's where you can really know somebody's phone number and pray, and when you need something, you go to the hospital, they visit you, and, and uh, they care about you. And if you're missing, they know you're not there. And, and um, God wants to put us in those kind of, I think, families to connect us. 
So, Mom, what picture that we've talked about today best describes you and your situation? Maybe you're in a difficult season and you're even ready to give up and the Lord says, stay the course. Don't quit. Don't surrender. Don't give up. Maybe you're going through a really delightful moment. It's just a really special moment for you. And I just say, cherish. Cherish this moment. Catch your breath. Enjoy this moment. Maybe assimilate a lot of the life experiences and things you haven't had time to really think through and, and, and wonder, how do I think biblically about this? And maybe, maybe you're just in a heartbreaking season. And God's word to you, God's word to you online and out in the tent, God wants to say to you, let me heal you. Let me heal your broken heart. Motherhood, would you agree, is not for the faint of heart. But we at the Highlands want to walk with you and we want to celebrate you. And, but more than anything, God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He's always there for you. I'm going to ask you to put everything aside, if you would, please, all of your notes, all of your whatever, because I don't want you to be distracted. I want you just to focus. This is a time we call response time at the Highlands. We've been hearing God's word to us. The Holy Spirit has been here ministering to people throughout the morning, and now it's time for us to respond. And so every eye closed. I want to ask you, what simple step might you take one that's not difficult, just something you can change about how you process life. Maybe it just means when you're, when you're really in a hard time that you just, you don't focus on just the hard things. You, you really look for what's really going on, the bigger picture. Or if you're in a really great moment of your life, it's just never been better for you that you would take time to just cherish that and just bask in the glory of that. Maybe share because we always multiply what we have when we share it with others. But maybe you're just flat out heartbroken right now and you feel like you're all alone and nobody really knows what you're thinking or going through, much less care. You're thinking, well, I know God loves the whole world, but he probably doesn't love me. Oh, but you're so wrong. Would you just, like Paul the Apostle tells us, to, would you just capture those thoughts and just say, those are lies. Those are lies because God does love me. He loved me so much that he came and died to pay the price of my sin and to put his Holy Spirit inside of me to give me his peace and his joy. And as you're meditating on those things, would, can I take a moment to ask any who may be here in the auditorium and you've never surrendered your life to Christ before, and this would be the perfect opportunity for you. If you're online and you've never given your heart to Christ, this would be the time for you. Out in the tent, you're there. and There are people in the tent there for you. And I'm just going to ask you to acknowledge that you need the Savior today. The Bible says we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and because of our sin, we deserve the punishment of death, which is to be separated from God forever and ever. But if you believe on Jesus Christ, if you confess your sin to him, he's faithful and just to forgive your, your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness, and he puts you in his eternal family. And if that's you, wherever you are in the auditorium, the Bible says if two or more people will agree on anything in his name, it will be established in heaven. If anyone agrees online together in his name, it will be established in heaven. And would you right now, just wherever you are, every eye's closed, nobody's looking around, just slip your hand up and say, I need Jesus today. I want to receive him as my Savior. Yeah, good. Yeah, I see you. Yeah, and you too. Yes, and you too. Yeah. Yep, and you too, I see you. Anyone else? I don't want to miss anybody. You and I agreeing together in Jesus' name that you're opening your heart to receive Christ today.
Yeah, I see you. Good, thank you. And you too. I see you too. You can put your hands down. Anyone else? I don't want to miss you. If you raised your hand, you're online, you raised your hand, or maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you, in your heart, you raised your hand, or you're out in the tent, would you pray a simple prayer with me? I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer. You don't have to pray it out loud because God will hear your heart as you pray. I'm just going to say, don't pray this prayer unless you mean it, and I believe that you do. Would you just say, Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner, that I'm far from you, and I deserve death, but I want life. And I put my faith today in what you did on the cross when you paid the price for my sin. And when you rose again, you offer me eternal life. And I receive that gift today in Jesus' name. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to be a Christ follower. From now on, I pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.